This program is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions shared on this program may not necessarily reflect the views of the program, the host, or any of our advertisers or affiliates. I grew up in the Caribbean. My dad's from Trinidad. My mom's from St. Lucia. My father was a minister. I grew up in the church. We were under that scrutiny as the pastor's kid. You were supposed to be perfect. You're talking about two girls growing up in the islands and all of a sudden, bam, you're in America. Questions that I had about men and about myself and all of these emotions and feelings that I had conflicted with what I was learning about God and the church. And that conflict happens in life and love and relationships. I am a mother. I raised three boys. But most of all, I am a woman who whose heart has been broken, who has gone through divorce, who knows what it feels like to lose somebody, and who knows what it feels like to desire somebody in your life that gets you and you get them. I know that being authentic and being real in this world opens you up to a lot of criticism, a lot of judgment, but I'm hoping that the show will be so authentic and so real that it really will touch people who are kind of living in the dark. There's no balance. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Balance with Diana J. Today's topic is gonna be a little bit more serious than our past topics as we dive into the topic of how slavery changed black love today. So I want you to sit back, I want you to relax, and I want you to enjoy another episode of Balance with Diana J. This episode is exclusively sponsored by The Estates Home Sales and Rentals and MrRelationshipMan.com. Michael and Connie Smith are global speakers, global ministers, and book authors. Their interpretation of God and our sexuality is revolutionary. Order your copy of The Proper Way to Eat a Peach today at www.znppublishing.com slash peach. Hello, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, Diane? I am good. I am good. Steve, I tell you, I am so excited about this subject that we're going to be talking about today. You know, you and I have been talking about this particular subject for over a month now. Yes. And um, I'm so glad that the day has arrived where we can really dive in deep into this conversation. But before we get any further, Please take a few minutes and let our audience know a little bit about you. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Steve Burlack. I am an author and a thought leader. Uh, my book is called Broadcaster Inner Champion. And I actually am facilitating an up new, a brand new uh, online launch called Elevate Your Life, uh, which actually helps people to uh, have the courage to create the lives that they envision uh, without fear of the challenges that they face. Um, and I'm originally from from uh, the Bronx, New York. Uh, I'm old uh, military, U.S. Army, as was my dad and my grandfather before me, very proud of that. Um, and importantly, I think for this discussion, uh, my passion uh, is in the subject we're about to to breach, which uh, my, my undergraduate degree is in history from City College of New York. And my master's is in education. And so my, my life's work uh, beyond Elevate Your Life and Broadcaster Inner Champion has always been about teaching people who they are to look into their past and, and, and understand the impact that it has on them today. And that, that all falls within Elevate Your Life as well. So excited to be here, very much uh, looking forward to sharing what I know um, yeah. and uh, hopefully helping some folks you know, sort this yeah, I, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this particular topic, Steve, is because, you know, one of the things uh, that I wanted to make sure was always a focus on this show, 
You know, there's lots of platforms that talk about relationships, but I believe that they concentrate too much on the surface part of relationships. Mm -hmm. And really in order for us, especially as a black community, to really start healing and figuring out how we can build long-term relationships between each other, I think it's really important that we go to the root. What happened and learn from that experience, become more aware of why we respond, react and do what we do. And from that, hopefully, hopefully find some healing. Yes. So diving right into um, this particular subject, I want to go a little further back than what I've heard in the past, which is Mm. uh, the days of um, slavery. Um, I want to know if you could tell me before uh, slavery even happened um, uh, to us as black men and women, you know, what was a relationship looking like between a man and a woman? What did it look like before slavery? Well, I can certainly tell you what I understand of it, um, just from my my own research of it. The first thing that I can say is that, of course, Africa is not a monolithic culture, right? It's, it's you know, it's, there's, there's you know, it's many countries, many languages, many cultures. Um, but in, in, in Western Africa in particular, um, uh, in some parts of Eastern Africa, uh, where the slaves were brought over to, to the U.S. and to the Caribbean, um, it's important to understand that there were both matriarchal and patriarchal societies set up. That's, that's one thing I do understand from my research. And that's mm-hmm. important that we get into like what happened post-slavery, but it's important to understand that both men and women in different cultures in Africa uh, experience being uh, heads of households and heads of relationships, um, which I think is important, the heads of society. Um, however, one of the things I think is very telling, uh, my focus is on U.S. history, right, and, and slavery mm-hmm. in the African American community. However, in my research, one of the things that I think is telling is that there's very little research out there, um, particularly for the layman, on what romantic relationships look like uh, within African communities, there's very little out there. Um, and what that tells me as a researcher is that many of us um, have gone through our lives um, trying to establish relationships without any baseline, culturally. We, we have no baseline, no understanding that we pass along family to family, generation to generation, that goes back to our roots in Africa. Um, and that's one of the biggest impacts slavery had. It, it cut off our very sense of who we are, even in terms of our relationships with one another. And we had to literally start from scratch um, here in the U.S. and, and in, the, in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. So um, so basically um, what you're saying in your research, it was hard to find any type of um, information when it came to black men and black women just having a romantic, intimate relationship with each other or how that looked. Did it seem like, because it seems to me that even when I watch uh, documentaries or read books on um, these countries, a lot of the conversations or, or it had to do with uh, their roles and uh, the passing on of their um, of their name to the, to the next generation. But I really didn't see like you're mentioning, um, anything when it came to the husband or, or, or the wife connecting in any, um, special way. That's very true. And importantly, also one of the things that is out there is that many of the societies in African cultures, um, focused on, um, on leadership resting with the elders, right? So that that's a common theme that you found uh, throughout the different cultures in, in Africa, even so much as having like councils of elders who were the leaders of the village, the tribe, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a tremendous amount of spec, respect placed on elders within the community, uh, which I think is also something that we lost, right? And that, that we can certainly, I think, dig a little more into that uh, but there's nothing, nothing that I found um, out there. And I suspect that even in academia, um, for instance, if you were to do, you know, if you were to pursue a doctorate on something like that, 
I imagine that the, the research out there is scarce. That would be my sense of it. Wow. Wow. So, okay. So here, and again, as you're talking to me, cause I'm learning also, um, you know, a lot in discussing this with you. So I'm visualizing what you're telling me. So we have, uh, a society of black men and women who already don't seem, uh, to embrace intimacy between each other. Then we have, um, a invasion of slave uh, traders that come into their country um, and basically kidnap them. So then we have a traumatic uh, disconnection completely of a man and a woman. So can you talk a little bit about, because Steve, it's like we had talked prior. I know that there are so many avenues uh, and branches that we can go with this. So, but I really just want to focus on the relationship and the intimacy aspect between a man and a woman. So here we have this traumatic event taking place. Um, what does that look like? for a man? What does that look like for a woman um, who obviously take pride in their country, pr take pride in their home, take pride in their family unit, but have never bonded as a man and woman? We are in a fragile real estate market, and maybe you are wondering where you stand with your property. Well, guess what? The estate's home sales and rentals are experts in this type of market, and they're ready to help you in the areas of residential, commercial, rentals, land sales, and acquisitions. Give them a call at 407-930-0626 or visit them at theestatesflorida.com. And don't forget to let them know Diana J sent you. Well, as you can imagine, and it's interesting because again, as a historian, you know, I can certainly tell you the stories uh, but what's important to understand here is that if you can imagine, all of a sudden you have these villages going through the trauma of having uh, family members, loved ones stolen from them. Uh, it's a tremendous trauma to face, uh, particularly given that um, there's this helplessness, that there's there's nothing that they can do to stop it. And, and that had to do um, you know, just with the fact that uh, the Europeans had the, the military means, the, the, the arms um, to overpower them. So if you can imagine just, and, and again, speaking as a man, right? If you can imagine mm -hmm. being a man in this village. A proud man. Yes, right? We're talking, these are, these are warrior society. I guess that's important to understand too. These are yeah. warrior societies, right? These, these are societies where, um, you know, for the most part, you see villages, if they war with each other, it's over resources like hunting grounds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's understood that men are the warriors and the protectors. So what happens to that warrior when his wife is taken and there's nothing he can do? How does he look at the rest of his villagers when his own wife is taken? How does he look at his wife when their child is stolen from them, right? This is a man who, and again, in order to be, since this is a warrior society, it's understood that they, I can, what I, what I do know is that mm -hmm. the male children, many of them underwent rites of passage to become men. That there, there were, there was training and structure around their becoming men. And all of it had to do with code and warrior code, right? And what it meant to be a man. And being a warrior and being a protector was a major part of that code. Right. So um, mm -hmm. I imagine what it feels like to come to, you know, to your wife and tell her that you went out to try and find your child and there's nothing you can do. Now, imagine being that wife who knows her husband only as this protector, as this warrior. She looks to him to fulfill that role. And he always has. And her child is gone and her man can't do anything about it. How does that impact how she now sees him? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I would submit to you that that's trauma that repeated itself throughout slavery and, and after slavery as well. And we're, we're suffering the impacts of it now. Um, again, I've seen no, no written books on that, no research on that. Mm -hmm. Only after slavery have I, have I seen books about that. But nothing 
that I've seen that talks about the trauma it was it relates to interpersonal relationships that people in these African cultures faced uh, because of the trauma safety of slavery. The only thing I can do sitting here is I can imagine as a warrior what that must feel like. I can't even imagine having that conversation with my wife or with my elders. So here we see um, pretty much the beginning of the deterioration of the manhood. Um, and then again, the buildup, it seems, of the insecurities of the woman, because again, like you said, um, I think we were uh, created to uh, feel and look to um, men for protection, uh, yes. for that security. So now yes. you have uh, women starting to um, feel indifferent about what's happening and looking at a man that they took so much pride in. And now you have a man, as you're saying, that is looking at the eyes of the woman that he's been taking care of, that he loves, his children. And slowly now we're starting to see um, his manhood being torn apart um, and out of control situation. Yes, and so, we're talking about centuries of this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here we have um, what you're saying then is a buildup, a buildup of, of emotionally, really emotionally and mental abuse. Yes. That starts happening between the black woman and the black man. And then, of course, we have, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, the history and the stories of the traveling from the country um, to America. But let's fast forward a little bit um, and talk uh, about, you know, slavery in America. So here we have a black man, we have a black woman that um, doesn't know this country. Uh, they don't, th their traditions are different. Uh, you know, um, the culture is different, the food is different. Um, there's a disconnection. Uh, they don't know where one or the other partner is. What is what is happening now, Steve? You know, tell me a little bit about that history. <laughs> there's a very famous saying, and I'm I'm sorry, the name of the person who said it is escaping me, and, and I uh, I'll tap myself in the head about that later. But the saying is, um, you know, once we were brought here, we were robbed of our names, robbed of our religion. We lost our 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 religion, our culture, our God, and many of us, by the way we act, we even lost our minds. Mm -hmm. um, if you can imagine, we, we come over here now, we're in, the, in America, and, and it's important to understand that by the time the slave trade came, uh, most of the cultures, many of the cultures that the slaves came from uh, were Muslim cultures, right? Most uh, Islam uh, had a very strong uh, root uh, in African communities uh, throughout the continent uh, by the time slavery comes along. And so what you're seeing now is beyond the trauma of the interpersonal relationship between man and woman, you're seeing the individualized trauma of a complete uh, degrading of self, of self-identity, which in turn leads to a complete degrading of self-worth, right? So now you know, there's a very famous scene in, in Roots in which Kunta Kinte is brought to the U.S. and um, he was given the name Toby. And Kunta Kinte, being a proud warrior, he understood the meaning of his name and, and the pride that he had in his name and why he should have pride in that name. And so for him, being given a new name uh, that had no meaning to him was emasculating beyond words, and he absolutely refused to accept the name. And the and one of the and it's funny because even the the actors in this scene talked about how powerful it was that they literally broke down in tears after the scene. The scene was where Kunta Kinte was tied to a tree, mm -hmm. and um, the slave master whips him. Yeah. Um, and, and whips him until he acknowledges that his new name is Toby. So he asks him, what is your name? He says, Kunta Kinte, and he gives him lashes. He asks him again, what is your name? And he yells out Kunta Kinte. And of course, everyone with, on the plantation is there watching this. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the humiliation, including women, immaculate, yes, it's it's including it's, the women, exactly, including the women and the children. So this man is being emasculated in front of everyone there on the plantation who has any care and heart for him. Um, and ultimately, after many lashes, he says, "My name is Toby." Um, mm-hmm. And so the con- the trauma continues, right? You're, the the first thing that was taken was our self identity, our religion, mm-hmm. our culture, our names were taken from us, right? You fast forward. This is why the nation of Islam uh, would would use the last name with X, would use the letter X as a last name as a symbol of the of the idea um, right. that. We do not know what our true surnames are, that names like right. Smith, Williamson, that these were the slave names of the Europeans, because that is true. We were given the last names of the slave master, right? The owner of the plantation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, again, it's hard to fathom unless you actually experience it. It's hard to, you can read about it, you can do research on it. But I don't think there's any way to truly understand what that feels like to be whipped in front of everyone you in your new community, which is foreign to you to begin with, um, and you're stripped of your very identity and your name. Um, and everyone understands that there's nothing you can do about it, right? Yeah. Um, that is a trauma that I, I am. I can only imagine stays with that individual for the rest of their lives. They, that, that's something you never, ever forget. Experience the power of essential oils with Zents, the world's first wearable aromatherapy technology for men and women that can relieve stress, increase concentration, or energize you while you're on the go. It's your mood, your day, your way. Experience Zents, 100% natural, vegan friendly, and no synthetic medications. Call 404-368-5836 to place your order today. So again, what I want to do in order for us to really um, capture the picture again, and what I'm doing is I want to bring awareness again Um, when it comes to the relationship aspect, the relationship between the man and the relationship between the woman and what is happening there. Um, So I want to focus on the man a little bit. So um, using that, you know, particular scene that you described there, um, explain to me a little bit more of some of the things um, that you found in your research that teared away from the dignity of a man. You mentioned one, you know, yeah. his name. Yes. Um, so what else? Let, let's talk a little bit about that, because I think it's important for women to know, too, and understand, um, again, the traumatic and mental and emotional abuse yes. that the man, a leader, a very proud person, proud yes. of his accomplishments and raising a family, um, having land, building homes, making sure that their family is taken care of, raising sons to continue um, their name. Here, we're, I want you to give us an idea of what other sure. um things were breaking down, you know. One of the things that I I loved at City College in New York where I I studied history was that we had access to tremendous primary and secondary resources. And one of the things that we studied, there was research done um, by um, these academics who who wanted to understand the the labor union movement. So Mm -hmm. they identified this man who was like huge in the labor union movement. This is back in the 1930s. And they wanted to interview him about labor unions, right? But as they started talking to him, they realized that he was a former slave. He was actually born some five years, about 10 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War, right? So Mm -hmm. as they're talking to him, they realized they wanted to focus more on his his life as a slave. And they actually wrote, uh, they wrote their paper about his life as a slave. But the important thing here for our discussion is that one of the things he shared that stuck with me 
was that he told the story of his mother and his father, both before slavery and after, and how they interacted, right? So what he talked about was the fact that as a young boy, you know, he saw every morning his father and his mother go out into the fields and they worked from sun up until sundown, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they did that every day, sun up to sundown, right? Out together in the fields. All of a sudden now, um, the Civil War ends, slavery is over, and they they found a place where they were able to um, to do sharecropping, right? So now they no longer they no longer have someone telling them how to handle this. They're making the decisions for themselves how they're going to handle working this farm. And what he talked about was that the father, now that slavery was done, one of the first conversations he had with his wife was that okay. This is what we'll do. I'm going to go out into the fields just like I used to. I'll, you know, I'll, you know, work the fields. I'll get everything together for us. You take care of the home, you know, just like, you know, it should be. Take care of the home, you know, take care of our children. Um, and then I got us from there. And the, the man said that as a young boy, he witnessed his mother returning back to the father saying, what are you talking about? I'm going to do exactly what I've been doing. I'm going to work out in the field just like I have been. That's what I do. That's what I want to do. Um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, just be in the home. I want to, we need the help in the fields and I'm going to go out there just like I have. Been. And so the first thing that he, he highlights with this is that we immediately see a breaking down of what's considered the traditional roles of men and women, right? In their mm -hmm. own homes, right? Um, the idea that the man was the breadwinner, the man was the one who went out, you know, took care of everything. The woman was the one who took care of the home. Mm -hmm. This, this continues the whole idea of the woman, of the black woman, no longer seeing her husband as the caregiver or the provider, not only not mm -hmm. the protector, but she no longer sees him as the caregiver or the provider. She sees herself as equal partners with him. And again, there's all kinds of arguments either there. I, I wouldn't espouse either one. What I am saying, though, is that now you see that there's this miscommunication about who we should be as men and women in our own family units. And that causes tremendous trauma that we see even today. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we see in relationships, fast forward to today, we see in relationships as a man, if I'm going I, I can tell you that I've opened doors for, for, for black women and I've heard them say, thank you so much. I've mm -hmm. opened doors for other black women and got cussed out. What the mm -hmm. hell? I can do that for myself. You don't need to open my door. What are you doing? Right. right? right. And that's just a small reflection of what we saw this man talk about, you know, right after slavery ends, the family unit begins to break down. The understandings that each person has um, is different now. But when you have when you have two people coming together and they can't even they can't even agree on what roles we should play, mm -hmm. um, that's why you see things like high high um, high divorce rates right within our marriages. You see things like that because we can't even right. come together on fundamental values because what we're talking about now are values. Mm -hmm. At the end of the mm -hmm. day, we're talking about values, and we don't right. share the same values person by person. Uh, or relationship by relationship. Um, and that had a tremendous impact on the relationships we have today. We are in a fragile real estate market. And maybe you are wondering where you stand with your property. Well, guess what? The estate's home sales and rentals are experts in this type of market. And they're ready to help you in the areas of residential, commercial, rentals, land sales, and acquisitions. Give them a call at 407 930-0626 or visit them at theestatesflorida.com and don't forget to let them know Diana J sent you and and again um, you had said something a few minutes ago uh, when it came to religion yes. and how <clears throat> religion and its impact on letting us know or telling us how we should um, interact with each other as men and women. So yes. not only are we being impacted um, by slave owners, but now here we are also in addition to that, 
um, being affected by religion in regards to how do we, you know, how do we interact? And then going back to what you said earlier, that there was no, uh, there was no instruction manual. There was nothing to look back on for no. us to even say this is how we should be. So it seems like um, the black man and woman um, have always been trying to figure out what is our role in this relationship um, from slavery. And, um, you know, one of the things I found really interesting, uh, Steve, that I had mentioned to you, in preparing for this segment, I wanted to do, again, my own history, um, you know, uh, finding pictures and so on mm -hmm. um, of black men and women and, uh, uh, you know, as couples during the, the uh, days of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised that I found a few. And when I say a few, maybe mm -hmm. a handful of pictures of couples, but these couples were ex-slaves. So it was after um, um, slavery or uh, again, uh, maybe at that point um, they became um, free. And in their old age, you saw them in a picture standing next to each other. But again, mm -hmm. even looking at the pictures, there was no, it didn't seem that there was no intimacy. There was no love. Um, it was almost like a role. This is my role. I'm stand here. I'm the husband. This is your role. You're the woman. You're my wife. You stand here. And then when I tried to look for younger, Steve, there was none. I could yeah. not, I could, yeah. I could not find pictures of a young man or a young woman and just finding <laughs> one as a couple, you know, finding them you know, holding hands or, or, or something like that. You could yeah. not find it. So was there a complete separation? No, it, it, it's interesting. Not, not exactly. That brings up another major point though. As someone uh -huh. who studied history and has taught history, I can tell you that one of the first things we learned is that you have mm -hmm. to question who wrote the history and who presented and why, what was their agenda? Right. Okay. It's not surprising at all to me that you would say that you could not find pictures of young black couples. Mm -hmm. One of the things that slavery, one of the huge impacts of slavery on relationships on men and women was that the black male was completely desexualized. That was extremely important for slavery to really to be fruitful, because if the black male was de was desexualized, um, he no longer was a threat, right? Because in order to justify slavery, the black man was hypersexualized on one end, right? Where he was seen as this threat to white society. And so that's why it was so important to, to emasculate the black male in that way. Um, so um, the only time you would see anything related, you would never see anything related to romanticism with young blacks people, what you would mm -hmm. see is a hypersexualized black male or black women. You would see pictures, paintings of black women with, you know, mm -hmm. large breasts mm -hmm. and you know, exaggerated yes. body parts. You know, mm -hmm. you would see that, but you would never see romantic love or anything expressed. And again, right. that has an impact on how we saw each other, right? And how we saw ourselves. There's, mm -hmm. there's a really important piece too, that I saw that, that speaks to this. And this, this goes back to, to the the pain between men and women. Mm -hmm. There was a picture that we studied um, at City College where we, there literally was a painting of a black woman who w her breasts were exposed and she was trying to cover them with her, with her hand. Mm -hmm. And she's pointing in the background and she's pointing to this white man, presumably the slave master. Mm -hmm. And you can see she's in tears, she's battered, um, you know, her clothes are ripped. Um, and she's looking at, you would presume to be her husband, right? Who's standing there. He has no shirt on. He's standing there and he's literally just standing there with his arms to his sides and he's, he's, you know, his shoulders are drooped and you can see he's completely defeated. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that this painting had no caption, no words, but it really showed the, the dynamic between black men and women through, through slavery and its impact on us. Um, 
again, this woman who, you know, we, we know through our research that, that you know, um, the uh, black women being raped on these plantations was very commonplace um, with the full knowledge of, of the men there. Um, mm -hmm. And these men were, so they're emasculated, not only in public, but they're emasculated within their own homes. If you can, can again, imagine coming home and Mass is in bed with your wife. And there's nothing you can do. You can't, you literally cannot do it. Now, again, you're a warrior culture. Mm -hmm. So I just want all of your viewers right now, whether you're man or woman, whether you're man or woman, I just want you to picture walking in the door. And you see your slave master in bed with your spouse, and there's literally nothing you can do. Wow. The, the, the problem then becomes, right, men, now this is over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, remember, I told you, the men that I grew up with, almost the vast majority of them abused their women physically and verbally. So you start connecting the dots here. Why? Yeah, yeah. You, Anger. These men and these women, these women are raped by their slave masters and they're coming to their husbands for help and they're not getting it. So imagine men being in this woman's place, being raped by the slave master and you're looking for protection and can't find it. So what winds up happening here is over centuries of this, you can't go to the cops. You can't go to the authorities. You can't go to the, there's no one you can go to in power who's going to help you. So what happens to all of this trauma over hundreds and hundreds of years? We wind up turning on each other. Yeah. We wind up turning on each other. I actually wrote a poem uh, regarding that called Reflux, mm -hmm. which, which literally talks about the idea that we start spitting up on each other. This acid reflux of the trauma yes. that we've we faced, we literally yeah. start turning on each other where yeah. all of a sudden, you see a man who's, who spends his life getting emasculated, even during my grandfather's time. It was understood. Mm -hmm. He wanted to become an FBI agent. There was no way he was going to do that. They, were, they weren't allowing black men to be FBI agents. That's what he wanted. That was his dream. So what happens when your dream is crushed, right? Right. Um, whatever happens to a dream deferred, right? And so um, if you can imagine men going through this and then all of a sudden they have nowhere else to take this out on but their wives, their children. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what they do. I write in a poem about the man is now faced with the choice. This man is turned from this manly warrior to many baby parts. That's what I write about in the poem. He literally becomes yeah. this big baby in front of his family. And so now he has a choice. Do I continue to face being this big baby in front of my wife and kids or do I run? And you start to see this play out over and over where men no longer even remain in their relationships. They have a baby with a woman and split because they yeah. can't face the fact that they can't do anything for their family. They can't provide for them financially. They can't protect them if, if they really have to. And so they leave. Now, again, that's without giving any judgment on whether that was right or wrong. I'm, I'm just right, presenting right. what of I course, understand right. as a historian of reading the impact. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you start to see. And then you bring that back to women who now all of a sudden, whether they wanted to or not, they are now the heads of our households. The women yeah. have run our households, our communities. Um, they have been the breadwinners. They have been the backbone of our, our communities for hundreds of years. Yeah. Hundreds of years. I, I grew up around women, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts. I grew up around them. I heard them talking. Uh, one of the biggest things I saw just even within my family. Now, my grandfather, thankfully, was one who was not abusive. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. I loved him so. Mm -hmm. But I remember seeing one of the things I saw with my grandfather. Now, my grandfather did become a private investigator. Right. And so he was very proud of that. He worked within the, with the police for 28 years in New York. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I noticed as a child was that when he would start to talk about the things that he knew regarding security, police work, that sort of thing, my grandmother and my mom would scoff at him. Like they would laugh mm -hmm. at him. They thought, you know, they were like, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, Wes. And, blah, blah, blah. and I remember seeing the look on his face and the pain that he had that his own, the women in his life did not believe in him as the authority. Now he, he wore, right. he would do security and stuff. He would wear uniform. He had great pride in that. Mm -hmm. And 
he had this era aura of authority and would but when he came home that authority was stripped from him by his own wife and his daughter and he, i know he talked he never had seen my grandfather's generation the men did not talk See, that's a whole nother thing for centuries, men did not talk about this trauma that we were we were brought up that we do not cry, we do not you know whine and and moan and and you know and and cry about whatever's going on. We handle it as men, but we know now in 2020 that that even that has a tremendous psychological impact on any individual that holds in all of that anxiety and trauma and fear. Um, Ultimately, what winds up happening is it explodes. And when you see it explode, you see it explode when a man comes home, dinner isn't quite ready. And then all of a sudden you see him explode and start beating her. Right. right? Because dinner's not ready. Yeah. And well, I submit to you that you're not seeing anything about dinner. What you're seeing is centuries of trauma playing out in one interaction with a trigger being, why isn't my dinner ready? My father was killed in Vietnam uh, when I was mm -hmm. seven months old. And in many ways, I, I feel that I was lucky. Right. Because that was the story I told. My father was killed yeah. in Vietnam when I was seven months old. Yeah. In all of the friends I had in middle school, only one had his father in the home. Only one. And again, these are all, all African-American and Latino uh, people, uh, mostly mm -hmm. Puerto Rican. Only one, only one guy had a father in the home. Everyone else just grew up with single mothers, right? And again, that's all because of what we've just discussed. Part, well, that's a large part of it. Maybe not all of it, but that's a large part of it. Because now men are faced with this decision. Do I continue to face this trauma or do I bounce? And unfortunately, right. many of them bounced. Experience the power of essential oils with Zents the world's first wearable aromatherapy technology for men and women that can relieve stress, increase concentration, or energize you while you're on the go. It's your mood, your day, your way. Experience Zents. 100% natural, vegan friendly, and no synthetic medications. Call 404-368-5836 to place your order today. So uh, let's let's go back a little bit because, like I said, um, I, I really want to kind of just get an idea of all of the things that men and women uh, women were experiencing at that time. And again, what you're doing now is showing. Uh, the similarities of what is happening even today in 2020. Um, you were talking about the, you know, um, how uh, there was no support, you know, when he came home. And I hear those stories now, you know, mm -hmm. men don't feel supported by their spouses when they come home or they feel proud. Uh, they feel that they're uh, made fun of or, or just um, not looked at with respect. But again, um, when I, you know, think back to some of the things that you had mentioned, um, Steve, you know, again, I'm looking at a very um, strong and powerful man that is, uh, again, been, you know, ripped from his country, again, uh, ripped from his title, ripped from his name. We talked about mental abuses happening right now. We're talking about emotional abuses happening right now. Uh, you talked about sexual abuse. Um, I think that is something that we don't talk much about, yeah. again, because there is such great shame um, in the male community because of their pride um, in regards to um, talking about, uh, even with the men, um, the sexual uh, rape and, and what they experienced it as men. So I would almost say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there was no area of a black man's life at that time that wasn't torn down. There was, it there wasn't was assaulted. really. Absolutely. Every yeah. aspect of his life was assaulted. Absolutely. I would submit that it, I, it, it's, it, it was the same for women, although there were different, there were different assault. It, was, it looked different. It took place in a different way. 
Um, so we both were assaulted, but for the man in particular, um, everything about him was assaulted and the, the attempt was to destroy who he was and leave the physical shell. Because the physical shell was important because that was the labor. Yes. Everything else yeah. that went with that, the, the soul, the spirit, right? The fighting spirit, the warrior, all of that had to be destroyed in order for slavery to succeed. On the next episode of Balance with Diana J. He said, well, you know, I've always found black women, you know, to be really attractive. I, I think they're beautiful. Right. But I just don't see a lot of black people where I'm from. But the black women that I've seen, I think they're gorgeous. He said, but to be honest with you, I'm terrified of black men. Wow. Yeah. Let that sink in. <laughs>